Oh my God, ladies and gentlemen, I'm here today with Sean Korn, my idol and my big sis. Um, this Welcome to Walk the Talk Show with Waylon Lewis, yours truly. We're honored to be doing this four times weekly in partnership with Google Plus and now SoundCloud, so you can listen to us there if you prefer. And um, we begin all of these. Sean, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, um, thank back. you. Thank you. With a bow of mutual appreciation, which is easy from my end, and um, a bow of respect to our viewers. So thank you so much, Sean. Um, I want to I want to take a moment just to offer a little bit of a uh, just a prayer. So, please for those of you who are out there right now watching, if you would either place your palms into Namaste or onto your heart, or just close your eyes, and then we take a deep breath in, exhale it out completely. And then calling in your, your own unique understanding of God, be it your higher power, or the creative consciousness, Mother Earth, or the Holy Mother herself, to this grace we ask. May this opportunity together be an experience of deep listening and understanding and a willingness to begin to explore the places within ourselves where we want to show up in the world more transparent, more authentic, and more committed to being of service to each other and to this planet. We ask for the strength and for the commitment and for the readiness so that we can prepare ourselves to be able to initiate a conversation that creates peace both within and within all. We ask, may this experience for all of us be blessed and may the energy that's cultivated within our hearts be offered outward into our, uni into our universe as a unified prayer for integration, for understanding, for connectivity, and for love. Blessed be and namaste. Wow. Well, I think we're done. It was supposed to be a 15-minute uh, conversation, but that was amazing. I don't know if you know the Holstein Manifesto, but the entire time I was thinking we should just write down what you just said. And, uh, well, you have it on tape, so you can if you'd like. Yeah, so there's so much in what you just said um, that covered everything uh, I wanted to ask about. Um, but... Uh, my first question, which um, may sound obsequious, but from my point of view, I've known you um, as a colleague and a friend uh, for many years now uh, through ups and downs in my life. You have nothing but ups because you're perfect on your pedestal. Um, but I wanted to ask how you work so hard. You're traveling all the time. I mean, obviously, you're doing fun, great work generally, it seems like, but work that you believe in, even when it's hard, like with Off the Mat, your service organization. But how do you do all this busyness and yet kind of keep uh, some sense of being grounded and healthy? I think that's a great question because I've done it really, really badly in the past when I first got on the on the road and it, it was just there was no there was no book to really explain how do you get on airplanes and into hotels and and try to shove your practice between beds like you know in hotel rooms that are freezing cold. There, there's no rule book to figure out how to do this. <clears throat> and so I made a lot of mistakes along the way and sudden, and finally had to realize that for me, and this is changeable for other people obviously, but for me that there are certain non-negotiables. And if I don't have, if I don't commit to these six things, I know that I'll be off my center. I know that when I'm off my center, I get really reactive. I get very intense. I mean, I'm intense anyway, but I get intense in a way that actually creates conflict because uh -huh. my self-righteousness comes up, um, my arrogance comes up, and I feel justified in what I'm saying, but my edge actually creates more conflict and even more separation. So those non-negotiables non are going to be yoga, meditation, prayer, diet, um, uh, therapy, and sleep. And mm -hmm. like I said, if any one of those six are off, then I know that there's a good chance I'm going to burn out and let some of my shadow behaviors rise more closely to the surface. So do you try and do all those every day? Or, yeah. Yeah, uh, or some variation. Well, not therapy every day, obviously, right. but deep processing work every day um, where I hold myself accountable, where I'm really looking at my own shadow, especially in, a, in, in the position that I'm in where there's so much projection and... And in some ways, you know, both positive and negative. And if I buy into that projection in either direction, if I if I take in all the the the, the ways in which people might judge me as being um, 
bad or flawed or the ways in which they might project on me that I'm amazing, incredible. Um, either way, that's not sustainable. And so I can't buy into any hype and have to consistently do the work on myself so that I'm holding myself accountable, that I'm recognizing where my shadow's coming up, where I'm making this experience more about me than about a bigger picture. You know, I'm committed to a bigger picture and I recognize that my place is meant to serve that bigger picture and me as a person is it's essential but no more essential than your participation or in anyone's participation so if I make it about me then I'm gonna lose um, that idea of being a part of a collective and so um, every day I've got to make sure that I'm checking in with my ego and what my intentions are and holding myself accountable not judging just embracing my humanity um, and doing my work. So therapy isn't every day, but deep process work is every day. Um, and diet, you know, if my diet is off, you know, I'll take everyone down because my addiction is sugar. And so, like, once I start getting caught into that cycle, um, you know, that affects my sleep. It also affects the um, just my ability to be really present. So those are some of the things that I have to make sure that I'm really committed to. Some variation of yoga. Some days it's restorative. Uh, other days, a little bit more hardcore. It, it, I can't have an idea in my head about what my yoga practice should look like based on what it did when I was 25. It has to be about sustainability and balance. So if I have a day that's really young, that's really intense, my yoga practice needs to be yin. It needs to be more restorative and internalized. If my day is more yin, then my practice is more young. And so I kind of base my practice not on my will or on my ego, but just what what can this practice do to serve my health and wellness both psychologically emotionally and physically so that I can show up in a healthier and more grounded way um, <laughs> right. we have to take 10 seconds after everything you say for me to just think about being in love with you and then I'll get to the next mm -hmm. question um, no that was very eloquent so I'm, I'm wondering uh, do you try and kind of do a lot of that when you first wake up like in my Buddhist tradition you're supposed to kind of meditate when you first wake up. Often the day kind of gets away with you. You're a very busy person. For the viewers out there, maybe they have children, mm -hmm. jobs, they have a lot of responsibilities. There's so much speed and aggression in our modern society and a lot of wonderful things too. How do you kind of make sure you do all those in a practical way? You're, for me, it's morning. If I know, like I've tried to kid myself and say, you know what, I have some free time at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. I'll get it done then. But I know me. My and I crash at four o'clock. My buyer rhythms. I'm I'm a morning person, so I wake up, get everything done as uh, you know, no matter what's going on in my head, because more often than not, I'll try to talk myself out of it, even after all these years. And so my I wake up and I get it done. Um, rarely am I going to do it in the afternoon, only if I have to. But I know it's not going to be the same. You know, I'll just kind of sit there. You know, I, I check out. It's the mornings where I'm really on top of things. Yeah, I mean, I can say from my personal experience, I mean, that is, I think, why I've, you know, I'm a kind of hypercritical person often. Um, what's going on in the back? Sean, watch out. <laughs> this is Janelle, who's yeah. bringing me a cup of tea. Janelle. Hey, hey, Janelle. Janelle. Hi, Janelle. Yeah. I just didn't know if you were going to be getting attacked. It looked very silly. <laughs> Janelle just brought me a cup of tea. Oh, look at that. Bye, Janelle. <laughs> Um, so awesome. much for being discreet. <laughs> no, it's okay. Um, yeah, I I have like about a hundred fans of myself right here, but I just I have to keep them back. We have some <laughs> big guys keeping them keeping them behind the ropes. Um, because for I me, need that. Yeah, there's so much hype about me. I have to stay grounded in my own <laughs> amazingness as well, like you. Uh, so. Um, no, I was just saying, I mean, that's been my personal experience of you. I'm very, I hold people to a really high ethical standard, and when I'm around you, you're never, or almost never, uh, Sean Corn. you know, in a good or a bad way. You don't buy in, you don't get high on your own supply, as they say in Scarface. You know, you don't trip out <laughs> on your own fabulous hair and fame and wealth and looks and all that, you know. Uh, um, I think it has a lot to do with my upbringing and on a few levels. One, I'm from New Jersey and I come from an environment where you just don't buy your hype. It's just not like that. I would have 50 people in my community who would smack me in the head and bring me back down to earth, almost literally. 
Right. And um, and so I think that's just the way that you know I that I was raised, and. Also, I just know because of I'm a, I'm a practicing yogi and I believe in this work. I recognize the trap that it is, and I'm grateful, really grateful for all of it. Especially when I think of the alternatives and and I've experienced the alternatives. I've witnessed it out into the world. I'm grateful that I have this platform, that I have the success, that I make a good living doing exactly what I love, um, and I don't want to compromise that by thinking for one moment it's all about me. Um, Knowing that I have this platform, then I know that I also then have a responsibility to serve even more than I would expect someone else to because of the privileges that I've that I've been given because of this the position that I'm in. So I don't buy the hype. It's not not that I haven't. There's been you know believe me, I have an ego like everyone else. But um, I also was really I I am really well loved. Meaning my mom, my dad when he was alive, my family. I, I'm loved and my self confidence comes from the only people I really care that about what their opinion of me is would be my immediate family if I let them down I would take I would take that very very seriously and I think because of the fact that I do have that kind of uh, that emotional support I don't feed off of it professionally I don't need it my self confidence doesn't get fed by uh, you know hundreds of people telling me I'm fabulous I only care really about 10 people in my life if they care if I'm fabulous Right. And I think that that also has a little to do with why I don't get too sucked up into this, um, because I I was raised with a pretty good self-esteem. Are like two of those ten your cats, or <laughs> my cats have more power than most of the people in my life? Yes. Uh, if they look at me sideways, I have failed. I I feel I have failed them. So right. yes, my cats, have cats, cats do. Really, if they look at you disapprovingly, generally. All the time. <laughs> yeah. So, um, I mean, I want to come back to how this is useful to others because, I mean, it sounds so easy when someone like yourself, like we just interviewed Joan Halifax Roshi and Sean Korn and Byron Katie and all these, like, selfless people who are all about service, and they make it sound, this whole self, this whole not being, taking ourselves too seriously and being grateful about our opportunity to serve in this life, they make it sound easy, but the fact is, like, you deal with a lot of business stuff, you deal with a lot of, you know, you're uh, involved with Off the Mat, this big service organization, you're traveling every weekend or every, you know, I don't know your schedule, but super busy. And there's plenty of opportunity to feel burned out and kind of self-concerned and kind of fed up with politics. And and I, I was just blogging this uh, Farrell Williams video last night where he is being interviewed by Oprah and he, he uh, she shows him all these videos from around the world of people singing his song Happy and he cries and he says like, he's so grateful um, mm -hmm. for those who have believed in him and it's so interesting and rare I think to see gratitude yeah. and vulnerability in you know celebrities or successful people so how can we in our lives because I don't I have an amazing life but how often do I really relax my own self-concern and feel grateful for the opportunity I have. You know, how can we connect with that kind of gratitude? I mean, I can't, it's it's hard for me to speak in terms of making this a general general statement about what everyone should do. I can only really speak for myself and what I believe. Get out into the world and see how most of the people live. And I don't mean get on a plane and go overseas. Just look to your community and you will recognize that there are men and women and children who don't have the same access, the same privileges that we have each and every day, and that the resources aren't as available to them as it might be to us, based maybe on our education, based in some situations on our gender, based very often on our color. And when we get out there and start to realize the challenges that most people face day in and day out, you can't, I can't help but feel, even in the challenges that I may have had, I still feel so blessed and so grateful. And when I get caught up in any rhetoric that's of being where I'm being, where I'm being spoiled or I feel like I'm not getting enough something, a little voice in my head just says, and not in a mean way, just says, how dare you? How dare you let your limit, limited beliefs, how dare you let your insecurity, how dare you let your own selfishness um, block you from really ex expanding your pers 
perspective and seeing the world in the way that it is. And so even in my heartbreak, even in my loss, even in the moments that have brought me to my knees, there's always a part of me that reminds myself to be really, really grateful because I recognize that I do have opportunities and gifts and resources that most of the people in this world will never have access to. I don't deal with the same level of oppression. Um, I don't deal with the same level of uh, lack of opportunity. And uh, it puts things in perspective. And so, but that's, you know, that, that's for me. I, I, that's how I live my life is just seeing that and knowing that we're in these bodies for too short of a time. And that uh, I don't want to live my life looking at what I don't have or being resistant to change or getting bitter when things don't go the way that I think they, they should. It's using every moment to grow and to learn and to know that each of these experiences can be initiations if you allow yourself to, to stand in that perspective. And every initiation just opens a door into a new world view. And I want to be a part of that world view. Um, for other people, I don't know how it is. I don't know their trauma. I don't know their experience or the, the tools that they have or don't have. For me, I want to keep cultivating the tools so that I can develop a language that can keep my heart open to change, both change within myself and change within this planet without really being attached to an end result. What's interesting to me is in over the years, me seeing you and many of the other yoga teachers at all these yoga conferences and festivals, is that kind of gratitude you're talking about enables you and others, hopefully all of us, to relax again our self-seriousness or taking our problems too overly seriously. And then you can actually have fun too. Like the not being self-obsessed actually helps us have a lot more fun. Like mm -hmm. I always am impressed when I'm you know, at Hanuman or whatever festival it is, Yoga Journal, and I see, you know, it's so interesting, like when there's a party and you can see some of these famous people are wonderful, but they don't have a ability to ha relax and, and have mm -hmm. a good time. Um, mm -hmm. And some, like yourself, are down in the middle of the dance floor just being foolish <laughs> and crazy, you know? And, and I think... See, I didn't think I was being foolish and crazy. I thought I was being elegant. Who knew? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Um, Thanks for that perspective. Well, we have photo proof of you being foolish and crazy. So. Um, no, but I mean, it's it's. I think people forget that service and not taking, not caring about yourself all the time, but actually helps us take care of ourselves truly and have a good time in life. So service isn't just the selfless thing; it actually helps us enjoy life. Well, my experience of service has never been selfless. I, I don't even know how to wrap my head around that. That seems like such an impossible quest, right. one that I'm not even interested in. Because in my experience of being of service, whether I'm being of service to my animals or when I'm holding space for a family member or if I'm doing some, some other kind of work, uh, raising money, uh, building, helping to build a building or paint a wall, um, I always, always, always get way more than I give. On so many levels, the ways in which it has matured me, my, per my perspective, the, the privilege that it has been for me to be allowed into someone else's experience, um, I get served. And so I service, I don't know how to wrap my head around that idea of it. I'm not even interested in trying. Yeah. Um, I don't, so I don't believe in that idea of self selfless service. It's a, it, for me, it's been a two-way street. Well said. I think that selfless service thing is um, also can be incredibly condescending and kind of like I'm helping you out of the goodness of my pure being and you're messed up and need my, need mm -hmm. my little yuppie help. You know? yep. um, speaking of yuppieism, I, you know, you said <laughs> in terms of helping uh, regain perspective, uh, in terms of reconnecting with gratitude and joy in our own life, perspective is helpful. There is a culture in the US and I don't think it's just one side of the aisle politically. I think there's a sort of yuppie attitude where you know if I walk downtown in Boulder there's homeless people everywhere and while some of us might see them and and say wow I've been given a lot and they've had a, we all have obstacles um, they've had different obstacles and that helps me connect with the fact that like I had a loving mother and a good education and you know, I had certain advantages, but, um, and I don't know their situation, can't assume anything, but there is a culture in the U.S. where you look at people who are less fortunate, perhaps, 
and you say, well, I've earned mine, and they're lazy, and they're bad, and they're doing drug or whatever the situation is, mm -hmm. where we as Americans often reject that sense of perspective and say people who have less on a conventional level, less or appear to have less than I do, deserve less because I've worked hard for what I have. So how do you, I mean, that's pretty arrogant, but a lot of us fall into that, right? Mm -hmm. So how do those of us who are less grateful mm -hmm. reconnect with that? Um, that's a really difficult one to answer because, you know, I, I like to stay on my own side of the street. Yeah. And, you know, I get paid to hold the space for people to explore a variety of teachings and to uh, open themselves to a myriad of perspectives. But you have to willingly come into my or another yoga teacher's environment to, to get that information. Um, I don't get on a soapbox and preach to the world and assume that my way is the way and that they should prescribe. You know, mm. I have this belief that everyone that everything is ultimately happening the way it needs to for an individual soul to transform. So maybe someone on the path needs to go through a period of real disconnection or selfishness based on their own trauma and there's going to be certain life lessons that will inevitably um, unfold for them whether it's this lifetime or another lifetime, you know, in my belief and that they'll get what they need in order to grow. That their the flaw or their unconsciousness might be in me, my perception to them, mm. not recognizing that perhaps this is an inevitable part of their own growth that I can't yet understand. So I can, I like to live my life as an example, you know, and I hope that maybe perhaps if someone's open to it, is paying attention, that it'll inspire something in them but I think the moment where I start to point my finger at them and suggest that they're completely unconscious in, in their experience, then the judgment is in me. And so all I can do is to keep, like I said before, cultivating these tools, stay on my own side of the street, and do the work and not allow myself to be absorbed into that particular point of view which I don't buy into, I don't agree with it, I don't connect with it um, but I also don't know what's between them and the God of their own understanding that's putting them in that place of selfishness. I don't know their trauma, I don't know their karma, I don't know their, their sense of lack. If someone covets it's only because they're so afraid of who knows, of death, of being alone, of being poor, of not having anything. I don't know where that comes from deep inside their own core wound. Right. Um, that makes me more curious than anything else. Yeah. Well, that's very generous. A lot more generous than I would be. Um, <laughs> so, uh, one final question, and then we're going to do two other little videos. Uh, viewers can find them on YouTube.com. Uh, slash Waylon H. Lewis or on elephantjournal.com. Um, so, final question. This was prompted by uh, a friend, Alex McAfee, you may know, um, who's here in Boulder. We were climbing yesterday and, and I asked him what I should ask you and he, he had a great question, I thought. He's, he, like myself, goes to many of these conferences and expos and festivals um, uh, where a lot of the yoga celebrities show up. and. Um, there's, he said that he's observing a changing of the guard now, where there's less kind of maybe of the Richard Freeman and the T.S. Little and the teachers I've kind of grown up studying with, and there's more of the kind of like hula hooping and Instagram yoga teachers, and um, many of whom are friends of mine, by the way, and uh, you know, maybe cool DJs and stuff. Like, there's just this sort of change, change, and I guess my area of concern while I, you know, I welcome all the kids, I'm only 22 years old so I'm one of them, um, is what is yoga going to look like? Yoga traditionally is something of a lineage where you learn from teachers and you study and you, there's some philosophy and you do a lot of teacher trainings and, and intensive work. What is yoga evolving into in your experience? Because you're kind of between both worlds. You're not, you know, 
you're not uh, you didn't study with Patabi Joyce in India with Richard Freeman or whatever, but you also um, aren't you know just kind of you didn't just walk into fame through your Instagram account. <laughs> well, actually, I, I I did study with Patabi Joyce in India. Oh, you did. And I did study with Richard Freeman. And you did and... walk into fame through Instagram two years ago. <laughs> that <laughs> that well, part's not true. Out. But I did have a lot of support of some teachers, including Matthias Rati and Eddie Modestini and Chuck Miller um, and Patricia Walden, as well as Patricia Wal Walford, who yeah. uh, excuse Studied me, with all the cool teachers. I get it. I was wrong. But, but they weren't. It wasn't that they were, especially in, in the '90s. It wasn't like they were cool teachers then. They were just teachers, yeah. and they took a real invested interest in my studentship. Um, and what they didn't do was to try to covet me and insist that. This one yoga was the way. They were very supportive in me and recognizing it was a lot of rivers and in leading into the same ocean and trying to expand my perspective. They were very generous in their mentorship, both with me as a student and with me as a teacher. To this day, I have made some mistakes as a teacher, and I mean, this is kind of behind the scenes stuff, but I've gotten phone calls from these teachers over the years, either to celebrate and applaud my efforts or to say, We heard you say ABC. We want to challenge you, and we want to ask you what you're thinking and why, and would you be open to um, evolving that perspective, and here's why we think you should. And so I've been mentored, uh, although it might not seem it, because I don't have a single teacher that represents me. I'm very respectful to the teachers that have come before me. Sharon and David, I mean, very specifically, since I've been with they, I've known them since I was a teenager. Sure. Um, David Life of Jiva Mukti. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There, I mean, Sharon, to this day, her biggest complaint with me is the fact that I swear like a truck driver. And she takes a lot of issue with it. And I'm a 47 year old woman. And yet she will still call me, write me, or uh, approach me lovingly and will say, Oh, Shawnee, you could do better. You could do better than that. And I appreciate having the support of these mentors over the years because their only interest is in me being my most authentic, most transparent, most learned self so that I can share and pass this information on. And, and so although I have definitely stood in two worlds because as I came up as a popular teacher, vinyasa doesn't come from a lineage. It absorbs lineages. But in and of itself, it's not a system, although people try to systematize it. It's meant to be creative. It's meant to be influenced by an individual. But when you have that, you also dilute the traditions and the lineage. And so I definitely see some of that happening now. I, I, I recognize it. I stand on the other side and I see what's happening. But I imagine it was the same thing with my teachers. When I started teaching vinyasa flow and pr praying in class and talking about shadow and bringing in these more contemporary methodologies, I would imagine a few of them had their head in their hands and wondered, like, oh, where is this going? Yet, I also recognize they believe that yoga is bigger than all of us. It's always been morphing and changing and growing. It has its own life force and is, has been open to some varying interpretations. And so I feel like I'm, in some ways I'm in that same place. I see some of the, the yogas coming up and I have my head in my hand and thinking, oh God, where is this going? I don't have an issue at all in the evolution of the yoga practice. I think what I do have an issue with, if I have an issue, is I'd like to see some of these younger teachers committing, and this is an assumption because I imagine that some are and some are not. I know that the, the celebrity of this is seductive and it is fun and you get to make money and be of influence in a way that a lot of us never imagined possible. For some, it's going to be because of talent. For others, it's going to be because of charisma. And it's a trap. And I would really love to see, to, to know that the younger teachers are really doing their deep inner work, that they're committed to their own practice above anything else, that they're willing to allow their yoga practice and therefore their teaching to change and evolve as they change and evolve, even if it means they might lose students because it's their art. It's their pure creative expression. Um, I do see that there are some younger teachers out right now that are doing it because of the um, um, because they're looking to become famous. Yet I believe in the power of yoga, and if that's their shadow, then 
there's going to be incredible lessons that they're going to have to learn in that that's going to mature them, that's going to awaken them in a, in a, a different timeline. So I think my job is to be patient. It is to mentor, which I try to do. Um, I, but I only mentor the people that I really believe uh, are committed to the work. And my mentorship is just support. It's guidance. It's just a lending an ear. And it's to share as much information as I possibly can without trying to covet it or yeah. protect it as mine. Um, and I don't know what it'll look like, you know, yet I try to trust that it has its own life force and its own mystery that's very independent of my perspective. Well, I think that's, again, uh, incredibly eloquent and wise, but also more generous than I would be. I come from the Buddhist tradition, and you know, lineage is definitely an important thing there in training. And when I go to yoga here in Boulder, which is has like two yoga studios per block um, by law, um, it's Cafe Yoga Studio, Cafe Whole Foods, <laughs> Trader Joe's, Cafe um, Bike Shop, um, but. Uh, you know, 90% of the yoga classes I can go to are led by, as you said, talented yoga teachers or charismatic yoga teachers. Um, almost never, and this is admittedly my assumption, but it's an assumption based on having taken their classes, is there, who is the yoga teacher we recently uh, had a talk with, is there things that I would say define true yoga? Right. I understand is is a big thing to say, but alignment, breath, and intention. And mm -hmm. I think there's always a lot of good intention, to be fair, but almost never is there a meditative or, or being present with the breath quality. Um, coming from the Buddhist perspective, yoga is meditation on some level. Um, and almost never is there alignment, let alone adjustment. So I, I see from Elephant Journal's point of view, a lot of the yoga industry, even that word is painful to say, mm -hmm. being driven by commercialism and by fame and by companies wanting to advertise teachers who are uh, talented or charismatic or beautiful or whatever it is. And I just, I feel really good. Like right now we have the best of both worlds. We have these mm -hmm. talented newcomers and we have people like yourself who, as I made clear, have studied with Patabi Joyce and many, many <laughs> And then we have, you know, like Richard Freeman here in Boulder, um, or Cindy Lee, or whomever it is. Um, but I just wonder about 50 years, like the direction of yoga being so physical, um, so, like when I look on Instagram, all I see is like 800 different yoga teachers with their yoga pose, and maybe there's some vague sort of woo-woo talk about being a good person, but... That's about all I get out of most of it, mm -hmm. and it and it I, it's sad to me. Like when I go to Yoga Journal conference and I get to study with some teachers who have really studied, like yourself, I, as you say, I become a more truly me and, and a kind of a better person. I work through tough stuff, and I don't yeah. find that encouragement from. But I, but I, I think what's really important though is, I mean, this is how I look at myself. Is I'm a bridge and. I'm meant to bring people from one perspective to another and then someone else brings them to that next perspective but they would have never have crossed that bridge without my particular whatever it is um, I think of my own dad you know my father being a tough New Jersey factory working owning individual um, who made jokes about yoga for years and years and years um, at my expense, um, and then he found a teacher that rocked his world on a physical level. My dad was super competitive, and hmm. he loved it. He, it was a workout, and I would say, "But dad, that's not what it's about." And he'd be like, "You know, what do you talk? What do you know?" I'm at that time. He's like, "I'm a 50 year old man." I was like, yeah, "Giving you know, up." You're on just Sean Corn. You don't know, you know what that? yoga is. You're just Sean Corn. What do you know about yoga? Right. Yeah. But he's telling me, he's like, you know, he's like, I was giving up on setting goals for myself physically. I was watching my body deteriorate. And now I can wake up in the morning yeah. and I can say, I can, uh, today I'm going to get my chest down in Baddha Konasana. He goes, and I might not do it today. He goes, but I might, might do it next week. And I can watch the progression. And I was like, okay, that's interesting. And it took years. But my father went from teacher to teacher to teacher. 
and each teacher became, it, it started almost going backwards. He went from the flashy um, teachers who might not have the substance, but man, they had the, they had the charisma that got him invested. And then it, oh, it shifted him, and suddenly he started working with alignment teachers. Then wow. the alignment teachers started to introduce him to getting still. The stillness brought him into meditation. And it was amazing over that 10-year period where my father went from being a student into being a teacher, how he evolved and how the yoga affected him. But it really began in a hardcore, hardcore drop-down, you know, just intense class. So I don't want to discount that moment because that moment brought him to the moment when he was able to die and be reading the Tibetan Book of the Dead and meditating and readying himself for that process. And so like, I don't want to discount what happened. It got him uh, a mainstream guy. I mean, right. it, it turned him on. Right. So I, I'm, I hesitate to look at a teacher who's offering something that you know you or I might roll our eyes at because of where we're at, where, where we're at, but someone else, they're singing to their soul. And they become the bridge that brings that person to the next part of their own emotional, spiritual experience. I mean, I think that's completely true, and I acknowledge that. I think there's a lot of charismatic, talented teachers in Boulder who are great gateways into yoga mm -hmm. for many people in Boulder who don't really, perhaps like your father initially, give a uh, shit, I guess I can swear it's my program, about... Um, about you know yoga and yoga culture and walking around in little yoga pants and you know whatever but I think the key word you said is bridge like if it can go farther if it can be a gateway if it just gets stuck at that level um, you know we're kind of short shifting ourselves there's a lot more we can get out of yoga mm -hmm. and I think people throw the word yoga around a lot and I just think it's important to remember that yoga isn't a word, you know, it is a path and it is a, um, I think tradition is too heavy of a word, but it's, uh, it's got a lot to it. Mm -hmm. and, um, anyway, so we've gone over time by like uh, 18 minutes, um, mainly because I do this whole program just as an excuse to kind of, we've had uh, Congressman Tim Ryan, all these amazing people, just to build up to the point where I could host you and just get to hang out with you and call <laughs> it work. Uh, so thank you so much, Sean Korn. Thank you, everyone, for watching. I think my uh, uh, friend, Bryony, who is just doing your course, uh, your off-the-mat course, is watching. Um, so uh, love to everybody, and thank you so much, Sean Korn. We could end with a bow of respect and a reminder of our mission to be of benefit. All right, and we'll be right back.